Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and legends. We've got one for you today. Sid Little, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm still alive, yeah. Isn't it amazing? I mean, here we are in Fleetwood, yeah. and then we look back 40 years, one of the biggest stars in the country, and now you choose to be here. And it is your choice, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's a, quite a, a long story, but basically what it is, we, 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 you know, we've been in show business, we've lived all over the country, and... Uh, we lived in Torquay for nine years, Preston and places like that. And Torquay was killing me because it was still, we're still doing the shows and that. And it was a, I was dropping Eddie off in Bristol and I still had an hour and a half to go. So we decided to try and move back up north, as it were. And we didn't want to go uh, anywhere. But we thought, what about Blackpool? And we thought, Lytham, which is the posh end, you know. And then our lad was only eight. So we found it looking for a school for him. And we found a school called Russell's, Russell School which is a public school, and um, it's up this end near Fleetwood. So we thought, hang on, if we get a house in Lytham, it's all for the next 10 years of our lives, backwards and forwards. So we bought a house, you know, um, five minutes from the school uh, in Fleetwood, and it was late every day. <laughs> but um, it was, uh, but it was, that's why we're here in Fleetwood, and we've been here 20 years nearly now, me and my wife, and... Um, She's got this little business called The Little Restaurant. People have called it that, but it's not. It's just pub grub, really. We're in a pub, but it's a little annex on the, on the, in the side of the pub. And uh, and it's nice. It's been She's been here over a year and four months now. Are people surprised when half of Little and Large serves them or is in the restaurant and they get to just have a drink with you? Because you don't expect that. No, well, it, it does have its... Uh, it moments, you know, people do come. They they look on the the internet and that. That says, oh wow, we couldn't believe it when you know we've been, you know, uh, served by Sid Little, you know. And I do it for a fun, really. I don't. She don't pay me at all. I don't. <laughs> so you know, but, but you know, it's nice being with her. And um, so uh, and it is quite quite good to see what people think, you know. And why are you doing this? It's because if I sat at home, you know, I'd be vegetating. So, so and I keep himself fit because you know, I'll tell you what waiting on is a, it's a, it's a, you know it's not easy I'd love to I'm going to get one of those bands on your arm and see how many miles <laughs> I walk a, a, a day you know and these are your people too I mean let's face it you were born in Blackpool yeah. you grew up in Manchester yeah. these are the people that you've entertained your entire life yeah Lancashire good old Lancashire people yeah and uh, then we, we started me and Eddie we turned professionally in 1963 and uh, we did um, we did uh, two weeks. You know, when we first we do two weeks in around Lancashire, around Manchester, mostly, and then uh, two weeks in the northeast. And people said, if you can crack the clubs in the northeast and Manchester, you know, working men's clubs, I'm talking about, and things like that, and nightclubs, you know, you can work anywhere. And and it was good grounding for eight years. In fact, one of the clubs we did in Manchester, the first clubs was a uh, was uh, at the Embassy Club, Bernard Manning, and I remember Eddie going. Uh, one summer's day we'd been told that he, he looked, I was looking for a new axe and he went and he said like um, he, he said to him he said uh, you know I've come for a job he said yeah right son uh, what's your name and Eddie we were called then you know couldn't afford second names and he said um, and he said Sid and, Sid and Eddie he said yeah I've heard of you he said how much do you want he said uh, well I was thinking of 60 quid but a, a week you know he said I'll give you 50 so I said oh alright <laughs> So the thing was, he, you know, he gave us 50 quid for the week and he was doing two, three clubs a night, seven nights a week. And when he was very poorly, as you know, he passed away, I went to see him and I told him that story. And he said to me, he said, you know what, you can come back to my club any time you want for the same money. <laughs> and he, you know, he, but he always said that, you know. And, uh, but he, he gave us our first full week's work and he, he, he was very, you know, he was very good to us. The trouble we went to, it, we'd been going there a few, about three years or something like that. And uh, we went one night, and there's no back door there. You have to go through the front, you see. So Bernard's on, and we're waiting at the back. And he's doing our act. And I said, hey, Bernard, you've just done our act. What, how can we work now? He said, I'll drop it tomorrow. You know, <laughs> and he's like, doing what Eddie used to do, Beetle D. Bodley, Mr. I forget his name now, from the kids' programme and all that, yeah. And he, did, he didn't care, he had no scruples. He used to get these comics from Yorkshire, and he nicked their act and then sack them. Yeah. <laughs> And I think as a technician of comedy, he's underrated because he was brilliant, wasn't he? Oh, it? yeah. He, he learned from, from a lot of uh, good comics, like, uh, I forget his name now, um, Jackie Carlton. He was like a, a gay comic before his time, you know, but he, he was camp, you know. And uh, he was brilliant. And he learned a lot of him and a, a few other comics and, uh, and he'd nick the gags. And then, but then uh, if he went on his own, you know, and uh, really did. And he's a good singer as well, that. He did the Oscar Rabin band, yeah. yeah. 
Amazing times. And of all the people you work with, I mean, through that period of the 70s, 80s and 90s, I think probably were the greatest comedians we've ever had. Mm. Many of them have now gone. We've got Ken Dodd left. Yeah. Um, who did you enjoy working with the most? Uh, most of them. Most of them. I mean, I can't say there was no one I didn't like, you know, or, um, you know, didn't, didn't get on with. Um, uh, no, there, there was... It, it, the, the, Basically, they are, you know, pros are, are pros, and they, you know, they're good and comic-wise. And but our favourite, I must admit, when people always say to me, "Who's your favourite comic?" and I've always got to say Norman Collier from Hull, and because he was so inventive and everything he did. That's why you know, like the chicken and and uh, you know, the, uh, it, everyone, every comic nicked that. Jim Davidson, he nicked it, you know, and uh, they all all these ideas, the chicken. You know, and the Japanese sniper, like, um, or, you know, a kamikaze, and then it turns into like a car, and he's, you know, uh, and you could, and all that, and get his nose yeah, stuck. Yeah. He was a le- so inventive. I mean, you'd be in his company, never saw him unhappy, and, he, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd do anything to just please you. Well, he pleased himself. That's why it was, he's pleasing himself, he's not really pleasing you. I mean, if he came in here now, he'd, he'd, he'd find something as a prop. And he'd, he'd make something of it. Oh, it he was hilarious, and he was good. And like we spent oh, many years with him. You know, summer seasons, pantomimes. Frank Carson, he was another one. Yeah, sometimes on my jibbles. You know, and he, he drove you mad, though, Frank. Oh, but uh, I love people like that. The Bernie Cliftons of the yeah, world who Bernie. love to entertain. There is a thing now. I think comedians try and not be funny, don't they, in real life? Which is annoying. If you're funny, be funny. Yeah. But I mean, those boys just love to make you laugh. Oh yeah, I was doing the cruise ships and the the flybacks to call them you fly out do a, a job then fly back you know and um when when eddie you know we had to split because eddie had the heart transplant and that was it you know and i knew i wasn't going to get back so i didn't want to give up myself so i found all the, the work and i did quite well for nine ten years well still i'm doing all right and um he uh and Bert, it was about five o'clock in the morning at stansted airport and uh, and and all of a sudden he heard this shout, Sid Little! I thought, oh no, you know, last thing you want at five o'clock in the morning, Sid Little! And I thought, oh dear, I've got my guitar and everything ready, knackered, you know, I drove from flipping Blackpool. <laughs> And uh, and, he, and he comes up and said, hey, if anyone would have thought, if I, I thought I'd have met Sid Little at Stansted Airport at five o'clock in the morning, it was, it was Bernie, bless him. <laughs> and he was going off to uh, Yugoslavia or somewhere, but to, to, he's in the band, you're the band for the man, the England team. And he, he plays trombone or trumpet or what. And, and he, was, he was there and he, he's another character, he's a real good character, good fun. Yeah. Does he break your heart in a way that those days have sort of gone where there are clubs on every corner where you could perform? and that these stars perform now I mean there's few and far between I mean there is Viva in Blackpool which is still trying to keep that yeah. although it's slightly corporate um, you know the days of having a stage like the one that's behind you in pubs have gone they're too busy sort of churning out microwave chicken aren't they yeah well well, the problem is you know it's it had its day the clubs have had the day but I feel sorry for the kids coming up now because they did miss they are missing a lot when you think live shows you can't beat live shows and I mean when these comedy clubs you're only on for about 10 minutes and then that's it so how can you prove yourself in 10 minutes you know I mean that was a thing you was on for an hour and you'd be dying for the first half hour but then all of a sudden you get them boom, and you used to get a buzz out of that you know and uh, and and but I can't see 10 minutes and also there's a different code now as well isn't there you know you can't nick anybody's uh, material you know or the, you know you get sort of sacked and god knows what but in those days it, you know it didn't matter <laughs> but then you out of it came like billy pierce you see smashing comic brilliant comic and billy at first you know cannonball hated him because said, you've nicked our act you know you know hey, what do you mean and he has but billy is billy yeah. and he's from you know and uh, and but look at him now he's fantastic billy he's a very talented fella very talented tap he can tap dance dance and um, and th- I think because of the clubs, you see, that's why this talent was found. But now th- they're not there, and all different types of called variety. That's why it was called variety. Variety is dead, you know. The last bastion, if you like, of variety is the cabaret, is the cruising. But even that's sort of uh, winding down now. Yeah, I I I I liked doing it at first, but then the, I hated the travelling. It sounds glamorous, but. It, it wasn't in the end, you know. But I did nine years. Yeah, it was 
quite enjoyed it. And I know they still invite you back. I suppose the only way to do that is if you make it a holiday and then do 245s in between. Because if not, as you say, I mean, last night I was talking to Chubby Brown, who was trying to get here from Newcastle. Took him like five hours or something. I mean, that's what gets in the way of this business. If you could just be funny, you'd be fine, wouldn't you? Yeah, oh, that'd be brilliant. You know, I mean, the, the thing on the cruise ships, what you just touched on then was what got me, you said like 45 minutes. You know, it sounds a lot in five days, 245 minutes, but that's four all together. You do two shows a night and that's it and so well that's a double but what they don't realise is you know and I'm blowing my own trumpet and, and people like me is alright I'm an old pro but I've got a history so as soon as they say I said oh you're on the ship oh great you're entertaining oh fantastic and then they cut, you're never off because like how's your mate how is he how's Eddie you know and uh, you know um, is he doing much now so you're talking to, you know PR you could lock yourself in your cabin if you want but you don't That's it's a PR job and that got me down because the cr- cruise people didn't realise that you know we we were ne- people like us we're never off right. because people want to talk to you all the time yeah. you know and, and, and but I am lucky I, I am a people person and I love it you know I'll talk to dead people my wife says you know and that's it you know so. how long did it take you to get the nerve to walk on a stage especially in the northern clubs where they didn't particularly want you to be there and have the confidence to carry on until the point you won them over well the thing is I started playing guitar when I was 14 I'm going back to the late 50s now Lonnie Donegan was my influence and people like that you know and uh, Tommy Steele and people all of that era and uh, rock and roll the shadows and everything and I, I would used to go to my mum and dad's working men's club at the Brooklyn yeah, Trades and Labour Club. And uh, where else did I go as well? Um, the Timpley Trades and Labour Club. And just get up and do, do, get paid. And, and then I'd, I'd make it out. I didn't know about four or five numbers. And it got bigger and bigger, my me, me repertoire. And then they decided to book me for two shows. And uh, so I was Sid Little, you know, that was it. And uh, uh, well, I won't say little. No, I was Cyril Mead. That was it, my real name, because I didn't, I didn't know any different. You know, and I went, went on stage with the clothes I had on. That's all I had. Because I was only 15, 16, and it would been with my mum and dad. I was all right. And then, uh, like, I was 17, I started to get a bit of a better act together. And then that's when Eddie Large came on the scene uh, in one of the pubs and uh, the uh, stonemasons in Timpley. And uh, he got, got up doing Cliff Richard impressions and things like that. And it just went from there. And then we got together and got together. And then we went to this Timpley Trades and Labour Club. And uh, I had came with his girlfriend of the day then. And he sat down and I did my first spot. And it went all right. And he said, can I get up with your second second spot? I said, yes, of course you can. Because we had a few numbers. Rubber ball, do you remember? Like a rubber ball, baby. And Eddie got bouncy, bouncy, you know. <laughs> so so we thought, that's great, you know. So I said, yeah, of course you can get up with me, yeah. So he, he did, he got up. And we stormed him, stormed him, you know. And the concert secretary come backstage and he said, Sid, he said, uh, I want you to come back, he said, but I want you to come back as a double act. I'll give you three, he was giving me three quid then, he said, I'll give you six quid. <laughs> well, me not very, being very good at maths, I didn't really, you know, three and three is six. And we always split it down the middle and it's, it was that way all the way through our career. We never, you know, you know, because the comic wants more than the straight man or whatever, it never happened. It was straight down the middle, always was like that. Although you weren't always the same name, you weren't always little and large, were you? No, it was Sid and Eddie to start with. Sid, Eddie and friend, because we had a, we had a Nicky Morris, he was called, he played lead guitar and we thought, oh, he's good, you know. So he was with us for a while, but he was in the Merchant Navy, so he was there and not there. Anyway, then it became Sid and Eddie uh, for years and we went to, we started to move around the country and we went to this club in, um, where was it? Uh, Ringwood, uh, near Bournemouth, yeah. And it was a posh, posh club, you know, like cabaret, cabaret restaurant. And it was, we had a great week, you know. And the fella said, uh, he said, lads, he said, uh, I'll have you back, he says, but change your name. I said, and we, we've been Sid and Eddie. I said, what, what's wrong with Sid and Eddie? He said, well, put it this way. He said, if I phoned an agent up and said, like, um, you know, uh, he's trying to sell you. You know, I said, yeah, what have you got? Well, I've got these two lads. They play guitar, sing, comedy. They're like, I said, oh, what are they called? Fred and Charlie. So when he said it like that, ah, Fred and Charlie, Sid and Eddie, you know. And we said, re- realised. Then we, the next week was up in Sunderland doing the work he's up there. And Eddie bought this cheap typewriter. And he stayed up all night once and he came back at breakfast time knackered and he had this um, this list of all these names because he was into golf and football so it'd be like Palmer and Nicholson, you know, Sid and Eddie Palmer, you know, and all, yeah. that, all these different names. It was Mike and Bernie Winter, so he's Sid and Eddie Summers, you know, and it was all this business. So um, 
And then in right in the middle, oh sorry, then right in the middle was Little and Large. I said, oh that, he said, yeah. And, it, and that was it. And we went on Opportunity Knox. Opportunity Knox, friends, friends, friends. If you can't spell Little and Large, just put crap. We'll know what you mean. <laughs> As one of Eddie's. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, that, and that was it. That, that, that was it. it stuck and... And then I think we we started the we were the birth of the the the, the, the cookie names the you know the weirdy names because there was like ch- cheese ch- chalk and cheese and you know uh, oh gentle and giant you know all these different double acts coming up with different strange names and then of course Tommy and Bobby Cannon and Ball you know and of course that was 1971 the rest it is was, history yeah. I want to talk about the first time you realise you're a star I guess the BBC TV show was the making of you in one way but was there a point when you realised you'd made it no we'd, we'd, me and Ed never sort of had our feet off the ground as they say we never sort of thought we were big stars I mean I remember when we first people coming up and saying can we have your autograph why what do you want our autograph for <laughs> you no know, because we want your autograph and we were very reluctant to you know we were, were reluctant stars if you like and uh, and then eventually you know we got the idea and, um, and and it sank in and then you know we start getting bigger money and then oh you move to a bigger house and all that hey, well you know this is a bit good but never we never sort of felt that we were like on on the same level as like Malcolm and Wise and people like that but for a time we were you know getting like what is it 10 18 million viewers and uh, like now you know they're happy if they get two thousand. <laughs> yeah, they are really. Uh, but uh, you know, but it, it's um, you know, I can honestly say. I mean, even now, because people say like, you've not changed. You know, we have. I haven't. I mean, like, say some people. Um, uh, uh, you know, like I remember Frank Bruno, bless him. You know, we work with Frank and all that, and I don't think he could cope. What one? Of, well, his problem was he couldn't cope with coming down. Mm. He couldn't couldn't understand why people didn't want him anymore. Right. And I think that's. That's the worst. It's, it's getting up there. It's, it's I won't say it's easy, but once you're up there, it's great. But staying there is the problem. But we were there for 14 years on television. But then after that, you start to come down and you go to the theatres and there's only half full. And then you realise. And me and Eddie thought, hello, this is it. You know, it's um, with the every, every act has its shelf life. And you know, as as uh, the, the theatres went and and clubs came and then clubs went. You know, it was harder to get the work, and uh, one that you know, weeks work became one night stands, which is even harder. And uh, and then Eddie got the heart transplant 15 years ago, um, and that, that put paid to us really. You know, we didn't fall out or anything. It was just that, and we didn't sort of communicate every day because it was like getting divorced. You were like you. And we'd been together for over 50 years, 1963, like I say, and, and then that was 19. 2000 he actually had to pack it in and uh, it's a long time and then uh, eventually you know he phones me up about something then I phone him up and then I, so we, we phone up nearly every day now because we're like two old fellas you know and <laughs> I've just had someone in the restaurant you know and, and he said what, you, did we ever do the so-and-so club uh, I'm gonna look at my diary because he's still got the diaries Eddie from 63 yeah we did it on October 18th blah, blah, blah. it's amazing you know and, and then I say oh do you remember this act and he said well he's been in today he's still alive you know amazing. and it's, it's amazing but um like I said before, uh, I, w- I went on my own for a while. It's mostly like a, a cruise when I feel like, and also because I'm retired myself in a way. But if a TV comes up like I did Master Chef a couple of years ago, I didn't get very far, but uh, it was alright. Apparently, it's just been shown again, you know. So, and this, you know, TV comes up, and uh, I'll do it. Yeah. And you do know there's a great warmth for you. I mean, for me and my generation, you were the backbone of TV in the 80s and 90s. It was extraordinary. And I wonder then about why you're still here and why you're still sane. And I wonder if it's family. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it is. You know, um, I mean, my, my home life. If your home life's happy, you know, that's it. That's all that matters. Really, everything else. I mean, when you think my wife's just put up with a lot through the years, especially when I was at the top of the tree, I never saw her. Because me and Eddie were together more than our wives. Because we were f- travelling all over the place in clubs and things, especially early on. And then TV came along and you just didn't have time. We'd have about, you know, our agents have booked your holiday because you've worked hard this year, you know. And then off we go for a fortnight and then we were back into it again. And that was quite heavy. I mean... And I think we've not changed, like you say, people want... I think a successful act is, you know, it's 80% 
they've got to like you. The audience have to like you. If they don't like you, you're dead. You could be the most talented person in the world, right. but if the audience don't like you, they switch off. And and that we had the boys next door. You know, we could have been. You know, that's that's it. You know, they liked us. And uh, and the the other thing is, it, it's 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 a sort of a twenty percent is talent. You know, I, that's my view, and which you know, I thought. And I always remember we thought we never changed. We never went blue. Where people, I always remember Jim Davison saying, "Oh, you know, put a swear word in." I said, "No, why should we? It's only the same act. Why put swear words in? just because everybody else is doing it?" Right. So we didn't. We kept it clean and everything. And I always remember a few years back. Do you remember Ricky Gervais and he did the extras? Is it? Yeah. And he did a second extras. And I got a phone call off my agent, and he said, um, he said, Sid, he said, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ricky Gervais has been on the phone, he'd like to use you for his um, extras, you know. I said, oh, great. He said, I said, what's it about, though, you know? So he said, well, he said his character, or his character, r- writes um, like a, a soap Coronation Street, you know, and he um, he sort of, uh, he's done, you, you're ca- you are playing yourself, Sid Little. And it's uh, it's Sid Little, and you you can't you can't remember your lines, which I thought, yeah, that's fine. It's always, always me that messed up on our. And he said, uh, and you're you're a racist, and I thought, oops, I thought, no, I need to know more about this, you know. So I said, I'll get Ricky to phone you. Anyway, a fortnight later, he did Ricky to raise, and he said, ah, yes, Sid. He said, uh, he said, um, yeah, and I said, I need to know more, Ricky. You know, I said because. Uh, you know, I don't want to. And he, anyway, he told me, and it was really I thought, no, racism and and you know, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, is it? Jewish, mm. you know, all this and gays, you know, didn't like gays and all this was all that. So I thought, no, and I'm playing. See, he's clever because it's it's like I'm playing myself. Right. He's playing a cat. Now you can imagine. It, and and anyway, so I'll tell you the story. So. That's it. I refused. He said, "Well, I, I admire your principles and all that. Thanks, thanks, and you know, all that." So I'm on a cruise ship, and I'm getting well in with this uh, magic act. And uh, they said, "I told them about uh, that." They said, "Oh, Sid, we know the one you're talking about. We know the episode because, you know, do you know who did your bit that you just described?" I said, "No, that's a Keith Jagwin." <laughs> So Keith like, so I went to see, you know, they took me to the cabin and because she had it, a mum sent her all the, she yeah. said, and I went to see, am I glad I said no? Because it's, I mean, I'm not going to do it, but it's rude things oh, and it's yeah. all like, the BBC's ran by gays and, yeah. and all this and I thought, no, and I couldn't believe he got, you know, how they got away with it. And But they see, because can you imagine got me doing all that? I said little, yeah, but it would have ruined fifty because they they don't they say did you see Sid little on the television last night? Did you hear what he was saying? So, you know, they, they don't see it like it's a. If I'd have been a character, right, then that would have been different because it's you're, you're acting, aren't you? And I hate to say, it, but he is laughing at those people a little bit with those cameos because he's giving them the role, but it is sort of taking the Mickey, isn't it? Let's face it, with all those people that have done it. Yeah. I mean, Jim Bowen did one with Peter Kay. It's the yeah, same sort of thing. Yeah. It's sort of mocking in a way. Oh yeah, yeah, but it's a. See, it's a different sort of comedy. You see that, you know. I mean, he's been very successful, uh, Ricky and, uh, and Peter and Katie, of course. But it's it's sort of moved away slightly from from what it used to be. Uh, but that's uh, comedy's always been a young person's uh, world, if you like. Like even back to the fifties, the Goon Show, that was like the forerunner of Monty Python's, you know, and all that. And so there's always something coming. There's always young people that have changed. You know, comedy. I get it, but we do love our history now more than ever. We do love our memories from our childhoods, and we would love to see Little and Large back. Is there any hope we could ever see a show with you again? Because I know Eddie's doing okay. You know, he's feeling better. He did a, like um, which I've done you know, on the ships. You do them. They call that spotlights, and they talk to you, just like you're doing with me, and you tell them all about your life and what you've done and what you're doing. And he's okay with that. And they, we have DVD that we take round with us. And I gave him one, you know, and Eddie, and it's all snippets of our show or whatever. And and it works well. But to actually do an act, it kills. us. I mean, Eddie can hardly walk from here to there without being out of breath, you know, because he's on uh, tablets and things. And uh, but he's like a creaking gate. He'll last forever. <laughs> yeah, I'll just drop dead. Yeah, but. Um, but, it, it, you know, they, they could be like a maybe like two Ronnies did, you know, the best of an interview clips from our show. Because we did 14 years and, you know, 14 years of uh, sort of 45 to an hour shows. So there must be some good material there. Well, and let's you not know. forget, I mean, in those days it was very competitive, probably more so than it is now. There are more acts fighting for TV back in the 70s than there are today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you lasted. 14 years is an incredible achievement. What yeah. were your highlights from that series? 
Uh, well, rather than the highlight of the series, I think the year, the best year we ever had was 1977, and we did the lot in one year, if you like, because we did a we we sort of we did our first TV show, which went from nowhere to number 13 in the ratings. We did our first big summer season in Blackpool at the North Pier, Little and Large, Frank Carson, Norman Collier, and Jim Davidson. Wow, all on the same bill, yeah. <laughs> and Jim was only 21, yeah. Yeah. Incredible. He was on his first wife. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but that, that was a great season. Oh, it broke all records. And then to top it off, 77, we actually did the Royal Variety Show. And with it being 77, it was the Jubilee year. Wow. And all these living legends were on. Oh, you know, I mean, legends. They were like people like Bob Hope was the compare. Because I always remember at the, um, at the rehearsal, it was before you know auto cue and all that, and he used to have the they call them idiot boards, you know where they, you, you read them, you know and all that, and he's reading. He said, "Well, uh, we've got this is the into for us, like uh, uh, two young uh, up and coming, which I think will be, uh, you know, uh, the stars of the future, and here they are, Little and George." So me and Ed looked at it, and said, who's going to tell the famous Bob up that it's Little and Large? And all of a sudden, for the gantry, he had the director always said, uh, "Bob, that's uh, Little and Large." So, well, goddamn, and he, and he went, he should throw a wobbly, you know, and uh, but he got it right at the night because, oh, please get it right, Bob, you know, and uh, Rudolph Nuriam, you know, Julie Andrews, Sheila McClate, oh, in fact, we did, what, what are we doing on here, you know, but it was great meeting the Queen, so that, that was all in one year, you know, wow, you know, and uh, and then, you know, we sort of, I think one of the acts, there was one we used to do in pantomime in summer season now again was the Andy Pandy sketch. And it, and it was like a, it was the two two bankers that used to write for the two Ronnies, and I think they they didn't want to do it, and it was all about you know what it went um, wasn't it fun to pick up a gun and fill it full of water? Oh Luby Lou was tying a shoe, she <laughs> bended down and whoops we caught her bloomers a pink and didn't they shrink? I think her left leg shorter. La 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 and we all fell down and we're on an air balloon, you know like the kids bouncy castle. But don't and Eddie would go right and he get so dirty in all the knots and everything. And we we, you know, we did it on television. It stopped, the sh- you know, on the television. Hilarious. And then we took it round with us, you know, on stage. Because I remember, at the, I think, Dominion in London doing a big uh, children's charity show, Princess Margaret. And they, 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 they hadn't tied it down. And this balloon was bouncing towards the pit where the band were. And it's going, because we're bouncing, I've seen it's moving. And it got these, the fellas, the stage hands with ropes pulling it back. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. I love pantomime. I don't know about you. I think they're bigger than they've ever been. Kudos have taken it to another yeah. level. Yeah. I know it's probably too hard work for you now. Who wants to work twice a day? Yeah. Yeah. That must have been a fun time to churn those out to bring kids in and, and do that act. I always remember, um, you know, like I say, we did uh, Cracker Jack in '72, and um, and it nearly killed us because it was um, we only did the one series, and it was uh, like uh, it was. Um, 13, 13 weeks of sheer hell because we were still doing the clubs at night because they wouldn't release us from the clubs so we were driving up and down, you know, getting on the train from Houston back up to Manchester, having a quick shave, something to eat and back to the clubs and coming back at three and then up at five again and that was and it nearly killed us and and then we started to go to clubs and there'd be mums in with little babies with bottles, you know, and all that and we, all of a sudden all those in, well, years, whatever we've been doing came to nothing because we were being classed as kids entertainers, which we didn't want. We were, you know, we'd been working the hard nosed comics clubs and the workies clubs and everything. And we wanted to be like, um, you know, like, like a mock and wise, not that we would ever would have been, never have been. But uh, that, that was what we were aiming for. And, uh, and it was, um, it really took us a long time to, to get rid of that stigma of being a kids, kids entertainers. Then we got back on track. And, and that was it, because one of the girls on that Cracker Jack was Elaine Page. Was it? Yeah. Wow. Because somebody, someone's doing a thing about Cracker Jack research, and he phoned me up about it, and I said, and it was Heather Barber, who I don't know, she was the juvenile lead, because I remember um, me and Eddie, we were the comedy, and Eddie was in a tutu, ripped tights, <laughs> lipstick, like, it looked like his mother, you know, a wig, blonde wig. You're turning me on here, sir. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> and he stood there like this, and this woman, this girl, Heather, bless her, 
I didn't sign up for this because she was a tatty, you know, like, I'm a juvenile lead, I'm supposed to do pretty. And, and he says, and you're worried? He said, I'm a married man with two kids, you know. And he said, you're worried, you know. Oh, it's hilarious, yeah. Beautiful memories. I mean, finally on the clubs, Dusty tells that lovely story of one day she was about to go on and they said something about, ladies and gentlemen, here's Dusty Springfield. Oh, and by the way, stop peeing in the car park. These great yeah. stories that, that oh, you don't yeah. get anymore. I mean, these were true. That really oh, happened. Yeah. Well, I remember, it, 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 I don't think it was, uh, it was some singer. And uh, the, the thing is, this this working man's, uh, you know, the, the, the what's call it, the, um, the compare. But they weren't called compares. They were uh, called club whatever. And he, he'd have the, you know, the committee, you know, he was one of them. And, and the, he'd introduced the acts and he thought he was being clever, you know, like he didn't, uh, because someone said, don't interrupt, you know, because he said, come on, give, give, you know, give, a, you know, give, a, give, them a, give the acts a chance, they just get on, they won't think, come on, give order, you know, and all that, because they were hard. And this girl come on and she was singing, I have nothing, was not she? So he thought he was being clever, so she's going, I, okay, Jim, order around the room, please. I who have nothing. Come on, I can see you in the corner. Where you're, you're. And he's doing it in the gaps, you know. And it, and it was hilarious. And, and and then you're like, come on, give the poor cow a chance, you know. And and, and that was true. That they're true stories. Oh Please yeah. Please tell me that wasn't Dame Shirley Bassey. No, I doubt it. Yeah, but but I mean, she, she, yeah, bless her. And, well, Shirley Bassey and Scylla Black were the were the the main ones that got toilets in the dressing rooms at the clubs because there was no such thing as toilets. I mean, Bernard Manning, going back to Bernard, like I said to you early on, there was no back door. You couldn't go out the back door. You couldn't get anywhere. At the you top. couldn't escape, that's no. what you're saying. So that's right. So once you're in there, and Bernard say, hold that door, you know, and you'd hold the door, and you'd be a hole at the back of the door, and you'd pee in it, yeah, down onto it. Honestly, it's true. You, I'm sure all the acts that a bit were around when we were. And that was Bernard. Oh, that bloody door, you know. Yeah, the idea that show business is glamorous. I think oh. Simon Cowell needs to rewrite the book, really, doesn't it? We were so <laughs> gutted when we went to the uh, Palladium, me and Eddie. For our first time ever, we went to the Palladium, was doing a, a two-week show with uh, Gilbert O'Sullivan, you know. I want to tell you. And um, we went in the dressing room, and it was like a prison cell. Like a bulb, you know, like you see. And, like, the walls were just whitewashed or whatever. <coughs> the only dressing room that was good was number one right. but uh, apart from that all oh, and it was so yeah you go out you see palladium and it's so glamorous and you think wow and then you go backstage but i think it's changed since uh, yeah, I think you know, since the rebuild it's yeah. not bad but in the old days i understand there were rats and everything oh, popping around yes. oh yeah that was cockroaches <laughs> cockroaches are the worst you, you you put your shoes on and they'd be run out with your pantomimes and that. talking about the agents for a minute yeah. oh, no. i remember i was on tour in 1965 with young warwick and the isley brothers the searchers who uh, else there was loads of you know it was a when when rock concert that's where rock concerts and we were the comedy compares and uh, and we went to this place, the Odeon, and there was no to no no to there was toilets, but the public toilets. And this is Dion Warwick, one of the biggest stars, <laughs> yo. Anyone who had a heart, yo, she was brilliant. And uh, and uh, the Isley Brothers, the, and it was one of the Isley Brothers, the three. And they used to, they brought her a bucket in no. so, so she could have a wash in, yo, know, wash her hand. <laughs> yeah, a blue bucket. I can still see it now, and it, with hot water in it because they didn't have it. Do you know what I love about people like you? You've done it so long. Every time I say something, it leads to another story. Yeah. We could literally sit here for 10 hours, couldn't we? Because oh. you've worked with everybody, worked everywhere and done everything just because of the time you've been in, in the business. Oh, yeah, these stories I wouldn't tell you. But <laughs> but there's uh, I'm mostly said too much already. But no, but the thing is, it, it, it is that, you know, you, we, we can't not say we've had a great life. We've, we've en I've enjoyed every minute of it. And it was just a fluke in a way because I was a painter and decorator, apprentice, painter, and Eddie was a electronics engineer at Metrovix in Manchester. And we we're just two lucky lads because, you know, we, we, we enjoyed our job. Our hobbies ended up being our jobs. And, you know, we were at the, unfortunately, we were at the right place at the right time. Royston Mayo, he was the one that really discovered, our, you know, little and large. So I was in a club and then put us on up because we did, we didn't we didn't we didn't want to do opportunity knocks because we thought we were big enough you know but tell you know we thought well, yeah everybody knows us but they don't tell you on television that's when they know it and as soon as we went on up knocks man it, up knocks it, it we won it but that was it for another five years we was in the limbo as it were and then it was only when we got the pilot show Royston again for Thames Television and it took off like I say and that was it and then then. But uh, it's it's not you know it's not what you know it's who you know 
and uh, yeah. what an amazing life and career and what a legacy I mean you've brought so many laughs not only to me but to millions of others as well and you're much loved you do know that don't you that we hold you with great affection yeah. little and large well, well yeah I mean you feel it I mean like I say I'm amazed people come in the restaurant and say like you have not changed a bit I said you don't look in the mirror every morning <laughs> you haven't you haven't changed but I know what they mean because I always remember we worked with Arthur Askey, bless him, and he never seemed, hello, playmates, you know, and like, it's your character, I think, yeah. and especially with me, it's my voice. But do you know why? It's because it's sincere. I think the public can smell a fake from 100 yards, especially on TV, because it's yeah. so much closer, and you yeah. can't maintain it for that many years if it's not really you. I mean, ultimately, this is you back then, still here now. Well, well I can't be anything but me. That's the thing. I can't hide behind anything, because... I'm, I'm, I'm me, you know, and, and I think that's what it is. If you're honest, you know, that that's it. It's when you sort of, um, you, you're not honest with people or whatever, that, that's when they, they suss you, like you said. But uh, that's it, yeah. What an amazing life and career. Thank you so much for your time. I've loved doing this, and we wish you all the best. Please bring Little and Large back just once. <laughs> if just once for one last performance, we'd love to yeah. see you again. Thank you for the memory. Sid Little, yeah. great to talk to you. And you, bless you. Thank you very much. Good luck.